Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome from Business Day and the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. We are um, very pleased to have you here today to discuss the topic of electoral reform. Um, for us at Business Day, it's it's a it's a great topic. For, you know, it's an opportunity to to look at our democracy. Um, which of which we're all very proud and to look at our democracy and say well how well is it working and um, are there things that could be done differently so I'm just going to hand over to my colleague Henning Sir he's going to introduce himself as well and tell you about the foundation and why they're involved thank you very much Carol um, good morning to everyone on the screens and um, on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and especially a welcome to our main guest speakers, Prof. Setim Bellembete and Rolf Meyer, who are obviously well uh, known regarding this topic of electoral reform. My name is Henning Zuan, the country director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in South Africa, which is a German political foundation which is already active in South Africa since the 1980s. We promote democracy worldwide. And uh, actually, I think it goes without saying that a debate on electoral reform definitely falls within the scope of our work. Um, and I also would like to say briefly why. Well, um, to some people, the debate on electoral reform might to seem a niche topic, but nothing could be further off the, from the truth, because um, an ele electoral system is defining the rules of the game, how a political party, or now maybe also independent candidates, can uh, get elected and therefore get into power. So it's very, very crucial. And we think that, um, and that is our interest, to push this debate into the public. I think the civil society has to be informed and has to be engaged and very vigilant, um, the media as well, and uh, for sure the political parties themselves uh, should um, have a, a very much a close look on the different proposals which are on the table. Um, coming from Germany, I also would like to mention that uh, the German model is a so-called mixed uh, electoral system. It's slightly different from the proposals which, um, uh, which are now in the debate, but I think, and I'm very happy to share this um, experience later on in this discussion. Uh, just Briefly, let me point out some questions re regarding this, and that is uh, the, in, with a mixed system, um, a big challenge is always how to achieve proportionality. That is very tricky. Um, then the question about the demarcation process of uh, the boundaries of the different constituencies. Then also questions, uh, is, it a, under, is it a system which is easy to understand or not? Um, because the, more e the easier it is to understand for the voter, the more likely it is also to find their acceptance. Uh, and last but not least, and um, I do not know if we get to this this debate, but it's very crucial, actually, who's going to benefit? Um, bigger parties, smaller parties, do independent candidates have a chance? I think these are all very interesting and very crucial questions, and I'm looking forward to this debate. Last but not least, I would like to thank uh, the Business Day for this great cooperation. And uh, with these words, I would like to hand back to Carol. Thank you very much and to take over the moderation for today. Thanks very much, Henning. Um, yes, I'm sure we're going to get into some of those um, some of those issues as we go on, and it will be valuable to hear um, the German experience. Um, so now the reason we're here at this point, um, just to give you all some background, is that um, um, Minister Mozzoleri, he's the Minister of Home Affairs, he established a Ministerial Advisory Committee in February. And the, um, sorry, my phone. <laughs> and, the um, and, and the point of the, the committee was to advise him on the Electoral Act and recommend how the Act could be made to comply with a constitutional court judgment. Now, what happened last year in, in June is that um, two NGOs took um, the state to court and challenged the, well, they, they challenged the constitutionality of the Electoral Act because the constitution um, does two things. The constitution says on the one hand in, 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 in clause 46, that um, the election of the National Assembly must result in proportional representation. But on the other hand, in the Bill of Rights, it says that everyone has a right to form a political party 
participate in a political party and campaign for a political party, vote in election and stand for public office. So this was actually the, the, the point these NGOs were raising was that our system doesn't enable um, individuals, independent candidates to stand, it only caters for parties. So what we're dealing here with is a need for a solution that can reconcile these, these, these two requirements. And we're also dealing with the fact, and I hope that Wolf will we'll talk a bit about it. Um, we're also dealing with the fact that um, in the 1996 constitution did not imagine that it was having the last word on the electoral system. Um, so the arrangements for the first election were, and even the second one, were temporary in nature. It was intended that parliament would return to this question of how the electoral system should work and how public representatives should be elected. So Parliament did revisit this. In 2002, there was a Fantail Slavit Commission, and that recommended that a constituency system be built in, um, along with a proportional representation um, aspect. And but that recommendation was not taken up. So here we are now. We've got what we're very lucky to have with us um, um, Sitimbile Mbete, who's a member of the that Ministerial Advisory Committee and its spokesman. And we also have um, Rolf Mayer, who we all know played a leading role in the constitutional negotiations on behalf of the National Party and who is now lobbying in favour of electoral change. So these are the minds that have been turning over these questions and we are fortunate to have them to, um, to give us their perspective. Now, just a little bit about them in case you don't know. Um, Dr. Sitembile Mbete is a senior lecturer in, in, in the University of Pretoria, in the Department of Political Science. And she's also a visiting re researcher at the African Leadership Centre at King's College in London. She is one of the most astute and intellectually interesting political analysts commenting on current events. And then we have Rolf Mayer. Um, he, at the moment, he's director in the Transformation Initiative. He's a lawyer by profession. He served as Minister of Defence and Constitutional Affairs in the Cabinet of former President F.W. de Klerk, and was intimately involved in the negotiations on the settlement of the South African conflict as chief negotiator for the National Party government. His counterparts in the ANC were Cyril Ramaphosa and Vali Musa. Vali Musa is the chairman of the, MA, of the, of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Um, Rolf also served in Nelson Mandela's cabinet and since leaving political office has mediated conflict in many countries. So I'm going to um, first start with um, Sitem Bile um, to tell us um, how has the, how the advisory committee understood its task, the task it was given arising from the constitutional court judgment and what um, what are its recommendations to, to Minister Mozzoleni? I'm aware that the report hasn't been released, but there has been some um, public debate about it. So I'm hoping that um, we can we can we can get um, quite a good idea of what of what the options are. So over to you, Stimile. Thanks so much, Carol, and uh, thank you to Business Day and to CAS for inviting me to be part of this uh, incredible panel uh, to speak about uh, the findings of the Ministerial Advisory Committee and the issue of electoral reform uh, more broadly. So as Carol said, uh, the committee really came out of uh, the Constitutional Court judgment in June of 2020 that found that the Electoral Act was unconstitutional insofar as it did not allow uh, independent candidates to contest in the election. Uh, in the current system, you can't contest in an election unless you, at national and provincial level, uh, unless you are a member of a political party. And so Minister Mutualedi put together a advisory committee to advise him on the policy options for electoral reform uh, that would enable his office to 
design a draft uh, legislation, an amended legislation uh, to put forward to Parliament for discussion. And the members of that committee, uh, as Carol has said, the committee is chaired by the former Minister of Constitutional Affairs, uh, Mr. Vali Musa, and the other members of the committee, including myself, were uh, Advocate Pansy Tlakula, who used to be the former chairperson of the Electoral Commission of South Africa, Advocate Vincent Maleka, who is a senior counsel, uh, Dr. Michael Sutcliffe, who's a former member of the Municipal Demarcation Board uh, and former Etegwini Municipal Manager, Dr. Nomsa Masuku, who is representing the IEC, and she's a current commissioner of the Electoral Commission, Mr. Norman Duplessis, who is a former IEC Deputy Chief Elections Officer, and Professor Daryl Glazer, who's the head of department of the political studies at Fitz University. And we since February uh, of this year, have been tasked, had been tasked with uh, discussing what the options would be and what the scope of electoral reform really would be. Part of what uh, the mandate that the minister gave us was to not stick uh, closely solely to what the constitutional court um, had uh decided in its judgment, uh, but that we did have scope to broaden the discussion uh, to look at more fundamental aspects of electoral reform, even if they wouldn't be necessarily be part of the discussions that will be taking place in Parliament uh, over the next year. And so with that kind of um, of, of freedom and, and leeway, uh, a lot of our first um, month or so of discussions was really around wrapping our heads around how far we would want to go with any uh, reform and what we understood the issues to really be uh, that needed to be put on the table, especially given, uh, as Carol has said, that the current electoral system, the closed list proportional representation system was really only envisioned uh, for the first election in 1994. It, lay, it was kept for the 1999 election um, when the constitution was um, decided on in 1996, but the intention was to uh, relook at the electoral system as South Africa's democracy uh, evolved. Um, what we also then did is that from uh, March, uh, until it was from March until May, we received a number of uh, written submissions by uh, electoral stakeholders, including civil society organizations, think tanks, political parties, organized labor and business uh, that generally showed that uh, the majority of stakeholders welcomed the constitutional court judgment, but they were uh, some disagreements about how to incorporate independent uh, candidates into the system, uh, and also some concerns about uh, the introduction of independent candidates exacerbating patronage uh, politics. And so what in the process of discussions uh, amongst us as the, uh, as the members of the uh, advisory committee, we came to see that we sort of fell into two um, into two perspectives about how to go about this electoral reform. The one view was that uh, the main change that needs to be done to the system in order to implement uh, the constitutional court's judgment is really just to introduce independent candidates so that the system did not need to be modified beyond the introduction of, um, of independent candidates, and that uh, the current system, as the Pancel Slavit report uh, stated, the current system is already a multi-member electoral system, right? That if you take the country as a constituency, uh, there are 400 um, MPs that are representing different uh, 
part of the broader constituency that is selected through uh, a closed list, a proportional representation system. And so all that really needed to be done was to modify the existing multi-member electoral system to accommodate independent candidates in the national and provincial elections, and that that could be achieved without making any major changes to the legislation. And uh, the point of view was that um, taking this option really uh, does not interfere much with uh, Section 46 and Section 105 that require general proportionality. Um, and it is the best option for ensuring inclusiveness, gender representation, simplicity, and fairness uh, for the independents. Uh, the other option uh, that, um, that gained favor uh, was of incorporating constituencies into our uh, national and provincial electoral system in a more explicit uh, way than is currently the case. So the feeling here was that the constitutional court judgment uh, did not just make a pronouncement on independent candidates, but it actually also put forward a view about the desirability of constituency representation. And so the feeling was that that uh, the it would not the that the implementation of that judgment would not be complete without introducing some element of constituency representation in order to allow for direct accountability. Uh, and so this option was uh, could be called a modification of the current local government election system. And according to that option, there would be a combination of the first past the post system uh, that we um, at uh, for constituency elections and a proportional representation list top up system uh, in order to achieve overall uh, proportionality. Uh, the major change with that system from the current local government system is that um, so the, it, it would maintain a half-half split, which is the current system that we have at local government, where 200, uh, where there would be 200 single-member constituencies combined with uh, 200 proportional representation um, MPs, and voters would vote for a single MP to represent them in their constituency, uh, and that would be their first vote, and then a second vote would be for a party to represent them um, in. In, in Parliament, and that uh, and the MPs from there would be selected from a closed party list. Now, the difference with the local government system is that the um, the board candidates or the, or the constituency candidates, because it would go, but the constituencies would be slightly bigger than our wards. Um, but the constituency candidates. Would those votes would only be counted for the constituency. And then the proportionality would only come from the uh, PR vote for the parties. Currently in the local government system, overall proportionality is determined by combining both the constituency vote and the PR vote. Uh, in this option, what would happen is that the proportionality would only come from the PR vote. Um, and the idea here was that uh, it allows for a proper distinction uh, between the, uh, the, the candidates uh, between the, the vote for the constituency MPs and that uh, for the party MPs, um, but also it leads to the least waste uh, of votes uh, for the independent candidates uh, that, that, that will be contesting uh, at constituency level. Um, and so these are the two options that the uh, Ministerial Advisory Committee submitted to the Minister of Home Affairs, uh, and he and his team will then be uh, decide which one uh, they want to use to amend the Electoral Act 
Uh, and the expectation is that an amended piece of legislation will be submitted to Parliament uh, by the end of this month to be considered uh, in order to meet the Constitutional Court deadline of June 2022. And as I frequently said in our uh, MAC meetings, that, you know, the we're the trailer, uh, the main production, the real movie is going to be taking place in Parliament because it is Parliament that is constitutionally uh, mandated with this kind of reform. Um, and it is Parliament that will undertake the much broader uh, process of public consultation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sister Billy. That's very, very interesting. Um, and it's I think that your your the, the deadline, the the uh is very, very, very ambitious. <laughs> so that the idea is that a um, that a, a bill goes to Parliament by the end of this month. I think that's that's most definitely not going to happen. So we can talk a bit about some of that process um, when we get to when we get to the discussion. Um, so hold that. I mean, just to all the participants, just hold that. We've got these two options. One is one is I think the the committee has called it the minimalist option. And the other is we have a big system where you 200 you know, members are elected via through war, through constituencies and 200 through PR. So hold on to that. And I'm going to now ask Rolf. Um, he's done um, quite a bit of, um, they, through this Inclusive Society Institute, they've done quite a lot of research on, um, on the electoral system and what people want and what would work. So Rolf, now so you were very, very involved in drawing up our constitution and our amazing constitution. Why do you think that um, it needs to be changed at this at this point? Oh, sorry. Nice not, to go sorry, not the constitution. Why do you think the electoral system needs to be changed at this point? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. I, I'm happy you make that correction because I would never favor a change of the Constitution in this regard. Um, in, in fact, the Constitution is very clear in its imperative, which you refer to as well as certain merely, and that is that in general, the electoral systems should be proportional or provide for proportionality. Uh, but, but let me just fill in where I'm coming from as far as this discussion is concerned. And thank you again also to you and Business Day as well as to Henning for, um, for arranging this. I think like Sitten Miller was also saying, we welcome this debate. We welcome the fact that South Africans are taking interest in the subject because it's very, very important. Uh, for the fact that the constitution as it stands <laughs> required actually a review of the electoral system right from the beginning. And it was never taken forward, despite the fact that the task team was appointed in 2002, like you said, the so-called Van Sal Slubber task team, uh, they made uh, their proposals, but it was never you know, implemented and th the matter is still in the air. <laughs> so so the, the Constitutional Court, to some extent, did us a favor last year when it raised the subject of electoral reforms <clears throat> uh, based on the inclusion of in independent candidates. Now, it, at the same time, I think the Constitutional Court judgment left us uh, with a little bit of a challenge. <clears throat> when I say us, it means in, in general, particularly Parliament. And you were absolutely right, and Senator Bella was right when she said, you know, <clears throat> the Parliament has to, to speed up the process. Uh, they have less than a year left to make the necessary changes. And, and it's not because the Constitutional Court I only said two years. It is also because of the fact that we have another general election um, in three years from now. <clears throat> so preparations have to be made uh, according to any changes that come forward. So um, the Inclusive Society uh, Institute, uh, which is an independent uh, civil society think tank, uh, <clears throat> launched this process of, of looking into the matter following the court judgment already in August last year. And the panel was appointed, consisting of 12 members uh, that included Dr. Diana Isaacs from Stellenbosch, Professor Dirk Kotze from UNISA, Professor William Kambedi from WITS, Ibrahim Fakir, well-known political analyst, uh, Trent Newpen, who was very much involved in the, the Van Sal Slobber Commission, but, uh, Professor Therose Kachalia from WITS, Professor uh, <coughs> 
Clint from Denmark, who was also a member of the Pansal Slobber Tals team. Professor Cheryl Africa from University of Western Cape, Professor Ratsi Malerpe, who is linked to the University of Cape Town now, and Grant Masterson, as well as Daryl Sonnepoel from the Institute, as the CEO. Those were the members of the panel, and I was asked to, to chair the panel, and that brings me into this position I find myself in, but I also out of my own interest in the subject. <clears throat> so what we had looked at was, you know, how can we actually come to some ideas, proposals that can contribute to the whole question of reveal of the electoral system? Uh, we, we heard various voices over the period of now almost 20 years since the, the, the Hans Slobert Dubs team <coughs> delivered its report. And many voices would have said, you know, this way or that way, more accountability, more representativity, et cetera, et cetera. I think Setin Bella has also referred to that. I think the conclusions that they came to as a, as a panel corresponds very much with what we came to as, as, as part of our investigation and research. And by the way, we have, we have dealt uh, uh, deeply with five other electoral systems that, that could correspond with the South African circumstances. And we had inputs and, and presentations from all of those, including the German one, Henem. And, and it was very, very useful for us to look at this at the widest possible spectrum. So what we came forward was <clears throat> something of a hybrid model, to some extent linking to what Sitin Bili was also referring to, a hybrid model based on, um, <clears throat> on, on, the, on the current district uh, municip municipal, municipal borders that we have in the country. It, it's already there. It's not new boundaries, it's not new constituencies that have to be formed. There are 66 in total uh, districts, including the metros. And we use that as a basis to depart from where we are at the moment to find a basis on uh, more specific representation, <clears throat> more uh, accountable representation, but at the same time also adhering to what the constitutional court requires as far as independent candidates are concerned. So we said <clears throat> our proposal comes down to the fact that we are proposing that the existing number of uh, National Assembly members should be retained, that is 400, 75% of them, that is 300, would then be elected on a multi-member constituency basis for these 66 constituencies. Uh, of course, the numbers will vary because there's a, there's a distribution of different proportions in terms of the geographics of the country. And for that reason, we are saying that the, the, the number of representatives per um, constituency, multi-member constituency, should vary between three and seven, depending on the number of voters in each. And that can be worked out on the basis of the total registered voters. Um, <clears throat> I think that the calculation was based on the last election, it was a total of 26 million 700 voters during the last election. If you divide that, it would give you roughly about 98,000 voters per constituency, elected constituency member. So, so we worked out this model and, and that balanced in the, the other 100 or 25 percent of the 400 would then be elected on a pure proportional system, more or less as it is now. So 300 from, from a multi-member constituency basis and 100 from, uh, from a proportional list presented by the parties. Now, the question, of course, is where does this more direct representativity come in uh, for, the, for the candidates based on the, on the proportional system in each multi-member constituency? The, 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 the names by party for a party will be presented on the ballot paper. In other words, the voter would know who are the people who are standing for a particular party in that constituency. And, and therefore, there is a closer link. It's not totally direct, but it is at least a closer link for the sake of the voter who can say then, I'm voting for this party, but I know who are the representatives of this party in this particular constituency. And that brings forward a more direct link and also the question of accountability can therefore be better served as far as that is. At the same time, the ballot paper will provide for 
independent candidates as is the requirement of the constitutional court and we think this is a model not without some shortcomings that can actually help the parliament and the portfolio committee in particular who consider this to, to find a way forward in, in bringing about a, propo a proposal that can serve the nation best um, lastly i think what we try to do is not only to adhere to the uh, proportionality, but at the same time also provide for a simplistic method or way of voting. And for that reason, we stuck to the closed system uh, uh, list for the sake of making it as simple as possible at the current moment. What we are saying is, if we go forward in five years, 10 years or whatever from now, the open list system can be followed. And that is where in other words, a voter will have the ability to make a choice between specific candidates from a party on an open list basis and not a closed list provided by the party, as is currently the case and what will be the case also in terms of our proposal. So that is, uh, that is in, in, in a nutshell what we, are, what we are putting forward. And hopefully it will, it will enhance the debate. Uh, you know, I think this general agreement, this matter has to be attended to urgently. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rolf. Um, right, so there have been some, some questions coming up in the chat, some statements about um, uh, proportional representation um, not being good. Some of uh, um, saying um, this the pain and failure, talking about the pain and failure of proportional representation. Um, has, has proportional representation really failed? Um, and how do we know that um, um, a, 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 a mixed a system where you have constituency um, constituency candidates will be any different? Now, I know that the committee, um, the ministerial advisory committee, did debate this. Issue. There was there was an opinion expressed that, um, in fact, you know, constituency politics could lead to more uh, patronage rather than less. So um Sitimbili, what what were you what were the what were the discussions around that? Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I think that you know one of the um peculiarities of uh, the PR system in South Africa is that it has yielded a dominant party system. Um, because usually a proportional representation system in most uh Places the two most prominent exceptions are South Africa and Namibia, um, but in most other parts of the world, a proportional representation system leads to greater electoral competition rather than less, because it encourages uh, the formation of, of of smaller parties of, of of many parties, and so there are multiple small parties. Um, and so that, and also it in, in a PR system, every vote counts uh, because every vote is literally counted towards deciding uh, who will get a seat uh, in, in, in the legislature. And so um, PR systems generally have greater uh, voter turnout than uh, first past the post systems uh, or pure constituency systems. And so Really, one of the peculiarities of our system is that it has yielded uh, a dominant party. Um, all PR systems do give parties uh, a great deal of, 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 of power. And certainly in our system, our political parties as the dominant um, unit of electoral uh, participation uh, are incredibly powerful. And because we haven't matched our PR system with any kind of legislation or regulation of how political parties operate, um, there is a lot of uh, differentiation actually amongst political parties around their internal systems. Um, there's not even really a requirement that a political party's uh, constitution needs to be, um, you know, aligned to the national constitution. Um, and so because of that, uh, and I think that the sense of PR having failed, 
is that political parties as the constituent elements of the political of the electoral system um, are not very accountable not only to their members but they're not very you know but even more to their support base uh, political party leaders political party leadership um, have an immense amount of power to run things as they do and i think that a lot of the disgruntlement uh, about the electoral system stems from that that people don't feel that they can influence their parties and yeah. therefore they've got very little influence over the their elected representatives. And I think that that was the sentiment uh, that led to the constitutional court uh, judgment uh, last year. And so part of what we, and, and of course, in our mandate as the, uh, as the advisory committee, we really couldn't delve into issues around uh, party accountability. So one of the ways that you would possibly do that uh, in a proportional representation system is having a system of open party lists. Uh, where each of the candidates on a party list uh, is, is voted on or vetted beforehand in a system of kind of primaries. Um, but, and we felt that that would be a, a very complex addition to the change already that was uh, ex mandated of, of including independent candidates. But I do think that there's a bigger conversation to be had around our political parties, their responsibilities, their levels of accountability, uh, and how party leaders engage not just with the electorate in general, but also with party members. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to play a short, a very short video now. Um, uh, that's from Bernstein Hazen, DA leader, talking about this issue of accountability. Hi, I'm John Steen Hazen, leader of the Democratic Alliance. Electoral reform is required in South Africa. We need to close the gap that has grown and ever wider between the electors and the elected. Many people feel disconnected from politics because they don't feel that their politicians at a national and provincial level are accountable to them. At the same time, we've got to find mechanisms to ensure that we don't have a majority rules uh, situation that crowds out other voices in the political sphere. That's why we've been tabling bills uh, and getting the debate going in Parliament around electoral reform because we believe that it's time for change in South Africa and we need to put voters back into the driving seat, not politicians. Great, thank you. Well, that was John Steenhuisen talking about accountability. Um, Ruth, what's your view? I mean, do you think that the system that you're, you're suggesting um, can actually solve this accountability issue? Um, or, or is it just simply the fact that because we have such a big dominant party, um, you're going to get um, party patronage um, and party control um, anyway? Yeah, uh, Carol, I think we have to go back to the question why did the Constitution say that there should be proportionality in general? I think it was for a very good reason, and that is that it was realized that in the South African situation, if we allowed for first past the post elections, in other words, pure constituency based elections with no proportionality, it's very likely that one party would totally dominate the situation. And that is still the case. It was like that 25 years ago, and that is still the case today. Um, and, and, you know, we have to be very cautious when we talk about scrapping proportionality. Uh, we're thinking that that is the solution to bring about accountability. I think it, it actually can contribute to the, to the opposite uh, in the sense that if one party can't, uh, totally dominates uh, on a constituency-based election where it's the winner takes all, then um, we've seen what happened in the past. That is how the National Party, <laughs> for instance, dominated the political scene for 40, 50 years because of first past the post outcome of elections. Uh, the very first election that the National Party won in 1948 was what happened as a result of that. The opposition had more votes than the National Party on a total, but, but it still lost the election because of first past the post. So, um, so we, we, have to, we have to keep this proportionality in mind when we think about the South African situation. And then I think that is why we are talking about the hybrid, bringing in some 
a representativity that can bring about more accountability than is currently the system, uh, the situation, because for all um, intents and purposes, at the moment, we have a complete proportional system, uh, an un unconditional proportional system at the national level. And, and I think that is why the hybrid idea is something that can help to counter the lack of accountability. I think we all cry for accountability, but the question is the how, without yeah. damaging the effect of proportionality. Yeah, we have, we have a question here in the chat from David Everett. Um, he says, is there a danger that we hope a healthy system will fix rotten politi politics? I'm not sure it works that way. And I think that, um, I think we'd all acknowledge that um, corruption is, is really one of our top problems in the country and that <clears throat> corruption of politics um, has been very, very much part of that. I mean, Sitimbele, do you think we can roll back the kind of culture, the political culture of, of corruption um, in our politics? Look, um, and I think David's question is spot on, right, about, um, and this was something that we certainly debated uh, quite a bit in, in the committee, that there's, and, and this crisis, this, worry of kind of public expectation, right? That a an electoral system will be a panacea, will sort of fix everything that is wrong with our political system. And that's just impossible. Like um, an electoral system is a technical way of turning votes into seats. That's literally all an electoral system is. It's in a democracy. It's how do you turn votes into seats in a, a legislature or, um, or, or, you know, or, or for president or, or for leader. And so um, the wish that people have that uh, the electoral system will somehow uh, fix all of the other problems that we have in our politics, uh, I think is, is misplaced. And we need to interrogate all of the other causes of our rotten politics. Uh, so the relationship between politics and money, for example, and, and, and between politicians and business people, uh, we need to interrogate what is it about uh, political parties? I go again to political parties because a lot of the rot in our political system is because of the rot within political party cultures. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say earlier is that we know more about the internal workings of JSE listed companies than we do about the internal workings of political parties. We don't know what parties' internal ethics processes are. We don't know what their processes around, um, about, around procurement are, for example. Um, no, not to mention then all the issues around, around financing and funding. And so, you know, if we want to change our politics, then we need to be asking far more fundamental questions than uh, what electoral system we have. Right. No, I think that's a very, very important point. Um, I think that, I mean, one of the issues for me has been that um, the kind of, the, the way the ANC in particular works, um, very much on a, a numbers-based kind of system. So from the ground up, um, it's all about it's all about the numbers, getting people, you know, basically, at, you know, kind of corruption in terms of getting people into vote to kind of elect those public representatives has been a highly corrupt process in itself. And um, yeah, so I think that for me that it's it's it's, it's become systemic. So yeah, it needs more than just a political electoral electoral change. It needs it needs a much bigger society wide change, which. Um, yeah, is a much more difficult and much more difficult thing. Um, got a question here from um, Nancy and CB around the Constitutional Court uh, ruling on independent candidates. She asks, what is the definition of an independent candidate? And, and are party candidates who weren't successful in their own party allowed to run as independent candidates? And I mean, and to that, I'd like to 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 add. Um, I mean, do we think there will be independent candidates? I mean, how do you, how many votes would you really need? Is it is it even a viable thing 
to, to, to stand? Um, and do we think there'll be a, a big appetite for that? But before we do that, um, we've got a little video from Musi Maimani, who um, has got a, 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 view, a view on independent candidates. Electoral reform can no longer be delayed in South Africa. It's important to realize that as the constitutional court rule that you've got to give power back to the people. And having independent candidates or parties independent of party systems, you give the opportunity for the citizens to be able to directly vote for someone. Secondly, directly recall someone. And ultimately, it puts people in constituencies. We live in a country today where, as you can see, we have state capture, we have a failure of delivery in certain communities, and ultimately, because the parties are so dominant, no one has been held accountable. And more than anything, when they are exposed for corruption, it's up to the party to decide when. That surely flies against the very principle of democracy. If we want a vibrant democracy, not only here in South Africa, but all over the world, we've got to be able to reform our electoral system, allow constituencies, and allow citizens to have direct access to their publicly elected people so that they can elect them or recall them and hold them accountable. So it is cannot be delayed anymore. It's a historical struggle. Both President Motlante, President Mandela, and now the recent reports indicate the fact that South Africa cannot continue along this path. We need to fall. Great, thanks. Thank you, um, Musi. Um, right, so Sitin Bile, could you maybe just, what, what are the advisory committees? say about independent candidates? What is an independent candidate? And, and, and um, what's the definition of one? And, and can, can those who aren't successful in their own party stand as independent candidates? Thanks, uh, thanks for that question. So the constitutional court judgment really hinged on section 19 of the constitution of the Bill of Rights, which deals with political rights. And basically uh, section 19.3, of the Bill of Rights says that every adult citizen has the right to vote in any elections. Uh, that's 3A and 3B says to stand for public office and if elected to hold office. And the real crux of the matter was that um, the standing for public office should be able to happen even outside of a political party that you shouldn't need to be a political party candidate to stand for public office. And so uh, any adult citizen in South Africa should be able to run for office um, in their individual capacity. And uh, that then includes a former party member who leaves their party and decides uh, to run as an independent. And we actually do see quite a lot of that take place at local government level. Um, and there's two phenomena that we see at local government level. We see a candidate leaving a party uh, and joining a we see a ward councillor, for example, leaving a party and joining another party, which triggers a by-election, and then they take that party's voters with them uh, because people want to vote for this particular individual. Uh, or we see uh, candidates running as independents um, when they have left their party or when they have a disagreement. And so that would still be possible uh, under the system uh, that is being uh, proposed. Of course, the reality is that of the uh, candidates, and we see it at local government level, but also in systems such as Germany uh, and, and New Zealand that have um, mixed systems uh, like these, uh, there aren't a lot of independent candidates that are successful uh, when they contest uh, at constituency level. Uh, and in some ways, uh, the calculations that we did showed that uh, there would be a greater chance to some degree for independents to win under the minimalist option than under the constituency option. Uh, because under the uh, minimalist option, uh, independent candidates are effectively treated as small parties. Uh, and so, and our system of proportional representation has a very low threshold for um, for getting a seat uh, in parliament. So a popular independent candidate uh, 
like everyone was saying last year when the judgment came out, a Patrice Mutsipe or AKA uh, would be more likely actually to get a seat in parliament uh, under that kind of uh, minimalist uh, option, PR option, and um, perhaps than if they ran in a constituency. Right, right. no, very interesting. Um, Henning, what's, what's the German experience? I mean, how, does, how do independent candidates work in Germany and, and have there been many? I mean, are there many? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, exactly. Sitim um, uh, I, I just can um, agree to what she said. No, we do not have a lot of independent candidates. Actually, I cannot recall a single one during the last uh, decades who was uh, successful in his or her constituency. And um, I think the reason for this is that, look, um, political campaigning is, is something really, it's a complicated process. Uh, you need funds, but you also need uh, some type of organizational uh, knowledge um, and uh, you, you need also political experience to do that. Um, so I do not think that we are going to have a lot of independent candidates in South Africa if South Africa decides to introduce a mixed system. But what I can uh, say from the German experience is that, yes, there is a better connection between the MP on constituency level with the people on the ground. Um, it, it plays a huge role in Germany in order to be elected, to be well connected in the constituency. Even the MPs who are, who are elected to parliament via the, the closed list are somewhere based in the constituency. Um, do we have more accountability, uh, less corruption because of that? I, here I have my doubts. Huh? There, there is a better connectivity to the, to the citizens and to the voter, but um, I do not know if we have necessarily um, a better accountability because um, of that. Um, <clears throat> what I also think is important is the question about uh, the funding. I think in the debate there was also um, the idea that uh, the MPs in their specific constituency then have uh, an office and that they have people on the ground. Um, and the, I, I really uh, think that this is a good idea because, because you need that. You know, political work costs money. Uh, you don't, you, 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 you cannot do it without funds. And I know that it's not very popular to, to give money to political uh, parties or to politicians, but but it does not go without money. So um, so I think that this is a very um, important uh, question. Um, one last thing um, regarding the uh, regarding the difference between the PR system which we have currently and the constituency based system. I think especially small parties, and here we talk about parties which have maybe less than 3% of the votes, that they are going to have more trouble to be elected or to hold at least the same number of seats which they have in parliament uh, because it's going to be uh, more difficult for them. Basically, at the moment, they are contesting for a pool of 400 seats in parliament. Then they are going to contest for a pool of 200 seats in parliament. And uh, the cons uh, to win a constituency, I think the small parties have, um, like independent candidates, is going to be very tricky. Um, if you uh, if you would do the calculations, um, I, I, I did that in the meanwhile. Um, we have something like 38 million voters in South Africa um, and 200 uh, constituencies. That means 190,000 uh, votes. Uh, per constituency, maybe half of the people are actually going and cast their ballot. So it's like roughly 100,000 votes uh, which are there. And uh, it seems to be easy to achieve, but actually uh, it's not, especially if you contest against a huge dominant party like the ANC. Many voters, and that is my last um, comment regarding the German system, um, many voters uh, they they orient they, they they don't care about independent candidates or small parties. They want to be with the winner, and then they they would cast their ballot uh, uh, with a like with a both votes for the same party. Um, I mean, it's a huge advantage that you can split your vote in a mixed system. Unfortunately, uh, most voters in Germany they, they don't do it. Some they do it, but but not everyone.
Yeah, I think that that's a very, very important point that people must bear in mind is that, in fact, um, the ANC's dominance in, in Parliament could grow um, rather than decline um, in a mixed in a mixed system. Um, I, I would love to go. Can I? Can I? Yes, can sure. I, can I make a point about independence? Yes. <laughs> um, just a brief one. I, I think we must expect there are going to be lists of independent candidates. Um, and, and we have to find a way to limit that. Otherwise, we will have ballot papers that become uncontrollable. Mm. Uh, so there are two ways to do that. The one is either through ensuring some signatories to support a particular person, or the other one is some, some monetary qualification. Uh, and that's something that still, I think, is also up in the air. We have to consider that. Otherwise, we're going to see a, a plethora of, of candidates yeah. Uh, and, and irrespective of the particular system that's going to be followed. Um, at the moment, we have 48 parties who participated, I think, in the last election. Can you imagine how many individuals there will be? <laughs> so so, so yeah. we, will, uh, we will have to keep that in mind, irrespective of that, whether they're going to be elected. I'm talking about candidates. Yeah, no, it does add to the complexity on voting day. Um, I, I want to move on um, just... We, we, we have to end soon, but um, there is a qu there's a question on the process from Wayne Uvedal. He says, we are dismayed at the length of, of time Parliament of the MAC has taken to address this matter. When will they achieve the July 22 deadline? We get the impression the Concord ruling does not suit the current major political parties, and they would rather kick this can down the road beyond the next elections. Now, I just wanted to make a comment here that, you know, we tried very hard to get um, some ANC participation and logistically it just ended up being not possible. But um, at the ANC is, is, is charged with this matter and obviously, you know, um, we can talk about Parliament has to resolve this, but, but clearly what the ANC does and what the ANC decides is, is, pretty, um, is pretty important um, uh, as to whether, you know, as to, as to how much reform there is um, in the end. Um, um, just uh, sit in bed, do you want to comment on on the deadline and on the and on the fact you know do the do you obviously would have heard from the major political parties in your in your um in your research um what what do you think they're kicking the can down the road they don't want this remind everyone that the previous uh, processes of electoral reform, uh, most uh, prominently the Fancel Slabbert reform, uh, did not envision incorporating independent candidates. Uh, the reform was all about uh, introducing some kind of constituency system, multi-member constituencies, but still envisioned as a parliament, as a political party uh, centered process. And so uh, what the Constitutional Court's judgment really did is that it added a brand new dimension to the discussion on electoral reform that hadn't been there before, really, in, in, in the in the popular discourse, or even in the discourse amongst people that study these things, right? So I've been in doing this work for many, many years. Um, and it's only really with the constitutional court judgment that we've really had to think seriously about what independent candidates would mean. So um, for many of the political parties uh, in parliament, uh, they hadn't been this kind of consideration on this particular issue. Um, and so many of the political parties really did look towards the, the Ministerial Advisory Committee for guidance on how to do so. I do think that, um, I mean, I fully respect the Constitutional Court's judgment, and I think that, um, you know, it was the right judgment. Uh, however, I don't think that the Constitutional Court fully understands how long it takes to make legislation in Parliament in general. And secondly, I don't think that the Constitutional Court fully understood what it would take to amend electoral legislation. Other countries that have done this kind of electoral reform, New Zealand's electoral reform went for well over five years from sort of actually well over nearly 10 years from the beginning of the process to a final piece of legislation um, and, and being applied to, to an election. Electoral reform is immensely complex. It takes a long time. 
And I don't think the Constitutional Court considered that in its judgment. Um, and that's uh, problematic. And I and I do feel actually for the parliamentarians to some extent, because uh, the, the, the length of time that it's going to take, that it takes to do this properly, um, is something that they just don't have. Uh, and and I do wish that our Concord judges would have considered that uh, and, and looked into precedent for how this kind of process actually works um, and has worked in other places uh, before setting the time limit that they did. Right, yeah, I think so. I think that's 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 very that's very true. Um, okay, so we've we've come to the end and um I would like to just give um, Rolf an opportunity to just make any concluding remarks he wants to. And then, uh, Sitimbila, you, are you covered or you want to make a last bite? You're I'm covered. Thank you, Carol. Great. Yeah, I think you've, you've given us really, really good insights. Um, so, Rolf, just, just over to you to conclude or to make any points you'd like to. Carol, again, thank you very much for uh, organizing this, this discussion. Uh, you and, and Henan, I think it's a good initiative. And it, it should be followed up. There should be more of this because it affects every South African. It's not the political parties at stake. It's every South African who has a vote. And yeah. we have to raise some more interest and awareness and the importance. We can't leave it, quite frankly, to Parliament only or the, or the political parties to decide on this matter. And I think this was, this was what the Constitutional Court intended as well. And I think we have to give them marks for that because they were very critical of the dominance of political parties in this whole process and, and sort of urged voters to come forward and, and to respond. So I think that is the whole idea behind this and it's a very good one. And, and I would hope that you for your, through your medium will, will carry on and, to, and raise the level of interest and the debate around this. Thank you very much. No, I think that is absolutely crucial point because um, political parties usually like the status quo. They don't like this, they don't like change, and um, and 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 they don't they don't deal well with with complexity. Um, so so I think that civil society, you know, if people if civil society really does want change, um, then it has to um, get up and, and say so. But um, I want to thank everyone for participating, especially our panelists. I think you gave us such great insights. Um, if we all had more time, we could we could carry on much longer. Um, but but yeah, I guess we've all got to get on with our day. And um, thank you very much to to Henning and and the Conrad Adenauer Foundation um, for participating and for being so enthusiastic about this and um, for, giving us, for giving us your insights. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. In essence, whatever we opt for when we reform our electoral system needs to have a balance of these ideas of inclusivity, diversity, representativity, responsiveness, accountability, and oversight in mind. I think that the main focus of electoral reform is that we definitely need to know the purpose that it serves. And in my view, the purpose is to enable citizens to exercise their full democratic rights, to improve the performance of our democratic government and its systems, enhance oversight, strengthen constitutional democracy and enhance accountability. Support for electoral reform is a core value of Action SA. As a necessary step to improve the accountability of elected public representatives to the electorate. The current party list system prioritizes representation over accountability and results in career politicians that are loyal to their party first and the country second. This must change for us to root out incompetence and corruption. That is why Action SA introduced a primary election system to elect candidates for ward councillors and mayors. It allows communities to decide who our candidates should be and hold them accountable once elected. This historic first for South Africa ensures that our public representatives answer to their communities first and the party second. 
governance and the regulatory architectures ought not to be chopped and changed for their own sake, obviously, and certainly not too frequently, except in instances where these changes are necessary to enhance processes of government and the experience of government by ordinary citizens. Um, change should obviously must serve a purpose, otherwise it can prove to be destabilizing and disruptive um, in society, and something as basic as the electoral system, uh, that is the process by which people in society select and confer power and authority uh, on others for making the decisions and distributing the resources in society, that certainly shouldn't be changed too often. But I think it's evident in South Africa to enhance the experience of government by ordinary citizens and for citizens to be able to exercise their right to the fullest degree and the greatest extent that they have the greatest amount of choice and the greatest amount of voice there's an obvious need for the change in the electoral system to enhance both the performance of democratic government uh, to ensure that it is improved and to ensure that citizens can exercise the rights to the fullest degree Electoral reform will define how my children are going to elect their representatives. So it's very important that um, it needs to be done right. It needs to be important that it needs to reflect the constitutional um, principles of accountability, transparency, and inclusiveness. So it's important that we do it right. Because As a parliamentarian who works closely with communities, I see the impact that service delivery failures have on the lives of our people. Service delivery failures also often arises from the failure of the executive and various levels of government to interact effectively. Accountability is key to ensuring service delivery. I serve communities that will judge the effectiveness of the electoral reform project on the extent to which it ensures service delivery. My biggest concern is that if electoral reform is not driven at a grassroots level, and fails to acknowledge the unique nature of African societies, this will make these communities mere spectators to the process. My key hope is that we pursue electoral reform in ways that makes the executive more accountable and enhances participation in the democratic processes.